we're going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Look at that thing, dude. That's not an LNS though, is it? It's not. That is an LNS, dude. Well, if there's like another thing. It's rotating. <laughs> So in physics class, we learned that um, we teach magnetic fields do no work, and this you can easily prove using uh, vector identities and all of that. Um, but then you have a problem. Here's a paper clip. It's pink because it's got plastic on it, right, to make it look pretty. Here's a paper clip. Here's a kitchen magnet, and here, if I hover the kitchen magnet over the paper clip, it picks up the paper clip. The magnet just magnetic field just did work on the paper clip, which goes totally goes against what you teach in your first year of physics class on electromagnetism. The speeds and accelerations are shocking. Um, you can't accelerate at a thousand g's and not expect there to be trouble. Um, most most equipment, I mean, people certainly couldn't survive that. We can't survive more than about you know ten to eleven g's over short periods of time. And even our aircraft can't survive accelerations like that. Our new, our new fighter jets, the F-35 fighter, or the F-22, the wings get ripped off at about 13 and a half Gs. So one of the ideas is that they are somehow warping space-time around them so that space and time is flat inside the bubble and then you accelerate the bubble. And that is one possible solution. Maneuvers that the Tic Tacs were making um, in the 2004 Nimitz encounter required about um, 1,000 gigawatts of power, which is more than the nuclear power output of the United States. So this one little craft, you know, 40 feet across long, you know, was producing more power than the entire nuclear power output of the United States. So again, you have to worry, how, how does that happen, right? And, and when it stops moving, um, that energy had to go somewhere. So where did all that energy go? Um, there should have been an explosion. If it just stops, um, that energy has to go somewhere. But we can't explain that either. It's a really important question, worrying about how your data is accurate. My work in robotics is useful. I'm trying to make a camera gimbal system so that we'll have a machine learning system that will track something. And then all the cameras will turn and track from different locations all at the same time. As a physicist, what it appears, he walks a very narrow line of giving you enough information to make it sound like it could be real, but not too much information to be able to prove that it's wrong. physics professor at the University at Albany. I, um, most of my work is focused on, focused on computational physics, where I focus on data analysis of various types. Um, most of the work is usually in astrophysics, where I'm working on detecting and characterizing exoplanets, which are planets orbiting other stars. And, um, and then I also do some theoretical work in quantum mechanics and quantum information. And, um, and in the past, I've done some work in robotics, which I'm not using to help. Yeah, I was curious about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had in the past done some robotics work there but I at the university, but I now mostly do it as a hobby and also I'm using it to help design instruments for to study UAPs, which is the last, most recent thing that I'm studying. So... I've been studying UAPs for about six years now, I think, and um, and I work with um, UAPX, which was uh, founded by um, two of the Navy veterans who had been in the Nimitz 2004 encounters, Kevin Day and Gary Forres. And Gary Forres is now the president of UAPX, and we still work with them. So our goal is to go collect our own data on uh, from UAPs our own videos, infrared videos, um, electromagnetic signatures, radio waves, um, things like that, and 
And that's what we're aiming to do. So I'd like to go for the beginning, the start, that the interest in, in UFO. And I think that's maybe to really give a bit, bit of background when the, that she witnessed that. I think it's in psychology, but I think it would be great to share the story. So, yeah, I've always been interested in, in space exploration. Um, I was, I grew up, I was very young during the moon landings and in the late 60s and early 70s. And I remember them and they were very exciting. So um, that had a huge impact on me. And I was about 12 when Star Wars first came out. So um, so that also had a huge impact on me. And, and later that same year, Close Encounters of the Third Kind came out. And, I, and in the evenings, um, this was in 1977, they would play on TV. You could watch um, a TV show in search of, which was hosted by Leonard Nimoy, who played Spock in Star Trek. And they often, they covered mysteries, right? All sorts of mysteries. So um, very often we're covering UFO sightings and and purported abductions and things like this. So, so I've always been interested in this. And um, and it wasn't until I went to move. I grew up in Wisconsin and then moved to Montana, the state of Montana out west, to go to graduate school at Montana State University, Bozeman, Montana, which is just an hour's drive north of Yellowstone Park. So it's a lo lovely, lovely area. And, um, and it was like my first, my first or second week there. Um, so this would have been early September in 1988, um, that there was a cattle mutilation on, um, on a nearby ranch. And that night there were multiple UFOs seen and reported at the sheriff's office and two cows were mutilated surgically and, um, you know, their sense organs, their tongue and their mouth was resected. The sense organs were taken out of the ears and um, and their sexual organs. So it's very bizarre. And it was all over the news the next day. And, um, and of course, the news was panicking because it's either Satanists did this or um, or aliens. And um, so so the ne that next day at the physics department, we, especially the new students who had all just moved there, you know, some of them from around the world, right? And we were discussing this rather vigorously in the hallway, quite quite boisterous, and um, mainly because we were all trying to figure out what kind of crazy place we just moved to. <laughs> and, <laughs> excuse me. Trying, we had to figure out what crazy place we just moved to, and um, and are going to spend the next four or five years of our you know educational career at. And while we're arguing or discussing what this could possibly be and what's going on, I we disturbed one of the professors down the hall who came out to talk to us. And he said, um, and it wasn't very helpful, he said, yeah, this happens from time to time, which no, nobody wants to hear that, <laughs> right? You want to hear that it's the first time ever, one-off occurrence, right? Um, no, this happens from time to time. And um, they investigate and never quite figure out what it was, and then and then it's eventually forgotten until it happens again. Uh, so it wasn't very reassuring. It was made it a little more freaky, actually. But then he says something even more important. He said, but he said, even stranger is that he has friends working at the Air Force Base up at Malmstrom Air Force Base, which is in northern Montana. And they have ICBM missile sites. Nuclear missiles are, are, are up there. And he says that they have problems up there with UFOs flying over the nuclear missile sites and shutting down on nuclear missiles. And we listened politely. And when he walked away, we laughed because we just couldn't imagine how that could be real. You know, how is that even possible? The U.S. Air Force would be on high alert and everybody would be upset. And But clearly that doesn't happen. So we thought that it was probably not true. And... Um, and then, so it kind of became like a running joke that year. Anytime that somebody said something weird happened to them, we somebody else would chime in. But you know, it's really weird. UFOs shut down nuclear missiles and we all would laugh. So it, this stuck with me for that reason. And then now fast forward, what, 25 years. And I'm teaching here at the University of Albany, teaching in physics. And I'm teaching an astronomy class. And we're about to talk about astrobiology. And some of the students wanted me to talk about the possibility of of an intelligent alien civilization visiting Earth. And I wasn't much sure, sure what I could talk about in class. I 
you know, what's he, what can you talk about in a physics class about that? I could talk about the Fermi paradox, the Drake equation, and, you know, I knew that. So I was kind of just poking around on the internet just for ideas. And I stumbled on the um, press conference that Robert Hastings held in, in 2010, where he had several former Air Force people talking about UFO incursions at nuclear weapon sites. And uh, the first person to talk in that, at that meeting was um, was Robert Salas, and he was at Malmstrom Air Force Base, the same Air Force Base. And I was blown away. I thought, oh my God, this is this is really true. I mean, this is real. And he w and what really struck me was that Robert Salas was talking about UFO incursions in 1967, uh, in the mid-60s. And I heard about it in the late 80s. So that's 20 years later. And I thought, wow, if this has been going on for 20 years and nobody does anything about it, I thought, well, that's really kind of worrisome. And it wasn't hard to imagine why nobody does anything because everybody thinks it's silly, right? So, um, so nobody takes it seriously and they just keep happening. And uh, I found that really disturbing. So I decided, so this was 2015 around, so I decided I should probably pay attention to this. So I started reading up on UFOs and researching the history and what's known. And it was only about, well, it was only two years later, December of 2017, when um, the New York Times came up with their um, article that outed the ATIP program, noting that the Pentagon had been studying UFOs. And, um, and then they released the three Navy videos. And I thought, well, somebody, scientists need to be studying this. This is not a joke. This is serious and um, possibly globally serious. So I, so I decided that I would study the topic. And that's, that's how I got roped into it, basically. It's a long version. <laughs> Maybe the first question uh, when you decide to go for studying UB, since you came from academia and you're still in academia, did you have like fear that how you perceived in with your beers and uh, the sense it's it's not taken seriously this topic? Yeah, I was worried about how I would be taken by in academia. Um, I kind of tested the waters before I really set out studying them. By I gave a talk just to our physics department, so it was rather localized. Um, on on UFOs and um, and word got out and it was a packed room. I think I don't know what the capacity of the room is, like sixty people or something. There were like a hundred people in there. There were people sitting on the cross legged on the floor all the way up to where I was standing. Um, it was that packed and um, and I gave a long. It was a long talk because I was going over the history and going over detail, and I played interviews with reputable people, you know, who have who have encountered UFOs, and um, and and their their response was just overwhelming. They were they were amazed and had a million questions, and I thought, well, this is interesting. This is we're not supposed to be treating this seriously, but all these people want to know, right? <laughs> all these academics and students want to know. So I thought, well, this is, this is a bit different than I expected would happen. And um, so I, I treated that kind of as a green light. It's okay for me to, to start studying this, but I'm going, I'm a physicist, so I'm going to have to study the physics, right? Aim, aim for the physics first. And, and that's basically what I did. So the first paper I wrote was on the flight characteristics, just simply measuring speeds and accelerations, which, you know, really is the first thing any physicist should do when you encounter one of these stories. You should jot down the equations and work out the speeds and accelerations just to see how reasonable or anomalous these things are. And you very quickly find they're very anomalous and, and the speeds are clearly spacecraft speeds. They're moving as fast or faster than spacecraft do. It's, it's really pretty remarkable. It usually leads me to saying something like, you know, people often criticize observers, you know, saying, why did you assume this was a spaceship? And and the answer is really pretty simple because they move as fast as spaceships move. Um, their accelerations are on the order of thousands of Gs of acceleration. And um, they've been tracked at speeds up to, easily up to 40,000 miles an hour, in some cases up to 200,000 miles an hour, um, which is really I mean, our fastest spaceships are about 40,000 miles an hour. The new, the new Horizons probe that visited Pluto right now is traveling about 45,000 miles an hour. 
So historically, this was known, actually. Um, Hermann Oberth, who was a rocketry pioneer, he was actually the mentor of Werner von Braun. So he's not just some silly guy. I mean, this is a rocketry pioneer. He gave a talk in 1954 on UFOs, and he noted that they had been measured with radar traveling at speeds up to 19 kilometers a second. 19 kilometers a second is about 42,000 miles an hour, which is about as fast as the New Horizons probe. And this is this is entirely consistent with the calculations that I've done. And, um, and he goes on to note in his talk that had there just been one or two radar observations, he would think that the radar observations were probably wrong, but he said that he had seen up to 50 of them. So this has been measured. You know, I've not seen that data had the fortune of getting to see it. So, um, and he notes that, that up to 50 radar measurements had been taken at least by 1954 of these things traveling at speeds up to about 40,000 miles an hour, 19, 20 kilometers a second. So this, this was known back in 1954. This is some people knew about this, right? <laughs> and some, some high level scientists and engineers knew about this. Um, this was not a mystery, um, but it has been kept quiet, clearly. Maybe before we go into Q few question, I think I'm be the first one I want to ask you about why in academia in particular, I think that this notion to dismiss uh, something like that to this case. Um, I'm, I'm also come from academia, I can a little bit understand, but I'm curious from your yeah, perception about why academia a little bit again is this like case of you be real false here. What, what is the reasoning behind that? Right. So so the question, you know, why do academics easily dismiss this? Um, they, they, they easily dismiss any new theory or new idea or, or data that's anomalous. Um, and that's because there's this general kind of an undercurrent that, you know, I, I, I would call scientism and others have called scientism, which is a belief that science can explain everything and that we know enough now to explain everything. And so if something appears or happens that's unexplainable, the assumption is that, well, clearly the data has to be wrong because if it, because we should be able to explain this. And that's, that's generally the, the, the thought, um, that there's nothing new to learn about, right, is what we think. And in fact, scientists in the 1800s even said that. The late 1800s were quoted as saying things like, we've basically learned everything now, right? And then then what happens? We discover relativity and quantum mechanics and the whole world changes, right? Um, but nobody learns the lesson from that. Um, we always think that we know everything. And I, and that very well could be because of how physics especially is taught. Physics, you know, it's presented to students as if, you know, we know this, we know this, we know this, we know this. And, and, and physicists are some of the most egotistical people I know. Um, and they do honestly believe they know everything, which which is which is a problem when you actually don't, right? And this is, and it's hard to discover new things when you believe you know everything already. Um, and and it's and it's kind of foolish to think that um, we do know everything at this point because we clearly know that there is no quantum theory of gravity, so we cannot get quantum mechanics and gravity to get along. So clearly we're missing something, and it's big. I mean, that's a big deal. Um, and some might question, well, how big of a deal is that really? How much difference would quantum mechanics really make? Because quantum mechanics would only make a difference if it's really tiny or if you're near a black hole, right? And that's what people generally think. But but that's not exactly true. Um, so I'll give an example for um, um, electromagnetism. You know, the 1800s, we had Maxwell's equations that describe how electricity and magnetism work. Um, and you can very easily prove, and we do in the first year um, electromagnetism class we teach, and I'm teaching my friend Matthew Shadagas, who works with me on UAPX, is teaching electromagnetism this semester, and I'm teaching it next semester. And one thing that we will point out is that for, according to Maxwell's equations, Magnetic fields do not work. Anybody who's taken a physics class and taken electromagnetism, you'll remember that. Magnetic fields do not work, and, and you can very easily prove this with vector identities. So in, in physics class, we learn that um, we teach magnetic fields do not work, and this you can easily prove using 
uh, vector identities and all of that. Um, but then you have a problem. Here's a paper clip. It's pink because it's got plastic on it, right, to make it look pretty. Here's a paper clip. Here's a kitchen magnet. And here, if I hover the kitchen magnet over the paper clip, it picks up the paper clip. The magnet just magnetic field just did work on the paper clip. Which goes totally goes against what you teach in your first year of physics class on electromagnetism. You drill home the idea magnetic fields don't ever work, you show it with vector identity is clearly true. And all anybody has to do is go home and do that. Like every three year old has done or four year old has done and knows magnetic fields do work all the time. Um why is that? Um, how can that be? The reason is because the magnetic field is is interacting with the quantum spin of the electrons in the paper clip. The quantum the, the spin of the electron, which is a quantum effect, produces a magnetic field, which interacts with this magnetic field, and that can do work. But that's quantum mechanics. That's not classical electromagnetism. So quantum mechanics makes a huge difference with electromagnetism. It is, that's what allows you to pick up a paper clip. Right. So now to assume that quantum gravity isn't going to allow you to do anything interesting is, is kind of silly, right? This is not this is not a minuscule quantum effect. I mean, this is macroscopic. It's big, right? You can pick up big things. You can pick up cars with magnets. We do that all the time. Big effect. Um, so so to assume that you know, these, um, that we know all of our physics and the physics that we're missing is, is inconsequential is really pretty silly. Um, you need really physicists need to have a little more humility, I think. And, and of course, then there's the whole dark matter issue that 85% of the mass in the universe is, is not made of this stuff. All right. We don't know what it's made of. We don't know we don't know what 85% of the universe is made of. And we're going to then say, well, we pretty much know everything. I, no, there's a, there's a problem there. And that, and that's the problem that I think academics suffer from. They don't, they don't really, they don't really understand what the pick, what the situation is. And, um, and partly because that's not taught to them. You know, we, we don't teach physics that way. We teach about what we know. And that, I think that's perhaps a mistake. I totally agree 100% with you. Maybe I want to ask about the, maybe before going the details about um, the physics of UFO. When you first, I, 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 in 1989, you didn't thought so much about the, the catamatulation and this incident, but when you saw the Tic Tac like videos, that's, I'm just curious at this moment when you saw the video, what kind of like question. I want to touch actually not only from the physics perspective, but also from the spiritual or religious, I'm not sure if you believe in God or are you religious, I'm not sure about that, but uh, if you can maybe touch the first phase of, uh, because I'm asking this question because to, to me it's baffling if there is something smarter than human, we don't know what it is. And it just, uh, to be honest, it makes the belief system, whatever, it's just uh, the, what we, I, I talked to Jack Valley about that, but it just make like our reality is not real and it seems there's something we, we, never, we will never know what it is if it we are just like um, simulated puppies in, in a universe or I don't know but maybe that's maybe the first part from your spiritual religious perspective before going to science but what what actually you thought about when you saw this like can you tell me about this experience? Right. I don't I don't think that the Navy videos influenced me a whole lot the and in fact, if you listen to the pilot's testimony or the pilot's descriptions, especially Commander Fravor, when he talks about encountering the Tic Tac, what he describes is far more amazing than what they've caught on film, right? Caught on infrared video. Um, in fact, it really does look like the Navy released the three most boring UFO videos that they probably had <laughs> because they're not very exciting. I mean, go fast, you know, go fast is actually not going very fast, um, which perhaps is more interesting. You know, I would, if, 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 the, if the object's not going very fast, then, then comes the question of where does the, where, how is it producing lift? How is it staying up? It's not a seagull, clearly. Um, I'm a lifelong bird watcher. I've seen like 20 species of gull around the world, and that's not a seagull. 
it's ridiculous. Um, plus, it's cold. It's it's a cold. It's an infrared video, and you can tell it's cold, and it's much colder than the sea surface. So what's going on there is very strange. Our machines run hot, and these things very often in these videos are cold. And so there's some interesting physics or engineering going on there already. Um, <clears throat> You know, how does it change your worldview? Well, it changes a, a, lot, a lot, but I mean, it's difficult because we don't really know what these things are yet, and we don't know what the story is yet. So um, so everything for me is just kind of in flux. Um, I'm not sure what the situation is. Um, it does appear that some of these objects could be non-human technology and very advanced non-human technology. So yes, certainly there could be someone around that's much smarter than we are, at least in this area, you know, building things, objects like this. Um, but but uh, that doesn't bother me because I never assumed that humans were the smartest things in the universe anyway. I think that that's pretty silly and... I would have hoped that we would have gotten past this with Copernicus when Copernicus, you know, showed us that the earth was not the center of the universe and Copernicus and Galileo provided evidence for that in his, you know, finding out that Venus goes through phases. So, and that Jupiter is moons. So we learned there that earth wasn't the center of the universe. Um, and the idea that humans are is really pretty silly too. We're not, I mean, I mean, look at the evidence. We're not that smart. I mean, we can build things, but we can't get along with each other. We can't figure out how to deal with each other. And um, and especially, you know, when we're fighting, we go, we go to war all the time. And it almost never works. It's almost more disastrous, you know, than anything and um, never really solves the problems. But we, but we jump to that solution every time. That, that, that's kind of a measure of stupidity rather than intelligence. So I don't think we're that bright in the first place. So, so that wasn't shattered for me. <laughs> and I can only hope that whoever, I can only hope that, you know, that the peoples who made these craft or objects are much smarter than we are and wiser than we are. That would be kind of nice to have some contact with somebody who, at least could give us advice because um, we clearly we need it. Although we probably wouldn't take it. We don't like being told what to do. That's our other problem. I knew you were skeptical and as a physicist, but I, I still didn't get the answer. Like, which likelihood do you think this, like, the, 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 this craft is like, I'm not sure it's human made or, or alien technology. That's maybe the probability of that. I know it's not wise to say this now as um from science perspective, but I'm curious. Also, you did answer me. Do you believe there's God? I'm not sure if you can answer this question because I think it's related. If 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 we think there's something smarter than us, that means maybe God is not what we perceive as in religion whatsoever. That's hard. I mean, I, yes, I do believe. Um, what does anybody know about that? I don't think anything. <laughs> I think we know very little, and um, certainly we don't act like we do. Um, we don't follow any of the teachings that um, were supposedly handed down to us, so we don't even follow them. So how how strongly do any of us really believe if we can't begin to follow the teachings? I mean, it's, and so I'm not sure how far that goes. But um, but as to what these objects are, you know, some of the they're UAP are a class of objects. They're all they're unidentified, so they're probably multiple things. I mean, I've seen many pictures of purported UFOs that are were birds. And as a bird watcher, I can spot them really quickly. That's a bird and his wings are full and it's diving or in a weird position that, yeah, it makes it look strange, but it's a bird. Um, and usually I can figure out what kind of bird it is, which is, you know, better, or at least the genus, you know, the type of bird. So I've seen pictures of swallows, um, lapwings, which are types of plovers and, um, and gulls are the three that I've seen pictures of that people thought were, you know, interesting UFOs. Not that interesting. I've also seen bats, people taking pictures of bats and thinking they were UFOs and vultures, vultures. Yeah. So there's five, five things, you know, that I've been able to identify, but so no, so not all of these things are interesting, right? Um, some of them certainly could be, and probably were, you know, um, 
objects being tested by aerospace companies or a government. Um, so there could be tests or, or, or special programs that not everybody knows about. Um, so certainly that those, that's another class of objects that have been spotted. And, um, but the ones that are really interesting, the ones that are moving at 40,000 miles an hour through the air without sonic booms, um, these are very strange. And, um, I've believed that some of these are non-human craft, um, advanced craft. And, and the reason for thinking that is the, the physics of these objects is, is far more advanced than anything we could do. And they've been seen for long periods of time. And there are, especially the UFOs that go into water and come out of water, been reported by ship's capstans. Um, I've seen reports going back to 1820s uh, where a ship captain wrote in their log that a disc came out of the, or something like a saucer came out, hovered, came out of the water next to the ship, hovered next to the ship for a few minutes and then took off into the clouds. Um, 1800s people are reporting these same things. So no, they're not Russian or Chinese in the 1800s or American. <laughs> There's somebody else. <clears throat> and there's somebody seems to be, oh, I'm sorry. And, and these, you know, so what are these somebodies like? They, they very probably live on Earth. Um, Carl Sagan had a long time ago said that, and he was, you know, very skeptical of UFOs. And he said that he had a hard time imagining that an interstellar spacecraft was arriving at Earth every other week. And I would have a hard time believing that too. Um, and right there already is a clue that they're not arriving from interstellar space every week. They're in the area already. And you can you can learn this when you look and see um, when there's a disaster of a sort. So the Fukushima nuclear power plant, when the tidal wave hit and you have, have had the radiation leakage, it was the next day there were UFOs in the area. So they got here within a day. Um, which means they're not coming from far away. They're coming from Earth, basically. So I think they're here, and they think they probably live here. Um, and and when you think about it, there the fa the fact that most um, most military sightings, at least in the Soviet Union, when they released their reports, about sixty eight percent of the military sightings had to do with water, had to do with oceans and deep lakes. So they're very probably hanging out in our oceans. This has been a theme that's come up again and again. And when I've talked to people from our government, that's always the question. What are your capabilities for observing underwater? They always want to know that. Um, in fact, Admiral Gallaudet recently put out a Seoul Foundation white paper where he talks about underwater UFOs and how they're basically ignored, but are very important. And so, I mean, 78% of this planet's surface is water. It's... It is the most poorly named planet in our solar system. This really should be called water instead of Earth or ocean. I mean, that's what it is. Um, and we don't know anything about our oceans. We know very little. We've mapped the surface of Mars far better than we've mapped the surface of Earth, which, which says a lot. So we're ignorant about our own planet and apparently ignorant about who lives here. So it's, it's just, I think is interesting. But I'm curious again at this point about, well, yeah, the possibility they may be living under the ocean or inside mountain. From the physics perspective, um, is it, can you tell me how that possibly could be? Like, like it's an adaptation, some different, like different from Homo sapiens or, or something. I'm not sure but from physics perspective. They're, they, we don't know who they are. So you have a few possibilities still on the table. They either are evolved on Earth like we do. So they're earthlings like we are, um, or maybe if they live in our oceans, maybe that's an aquatic species, right? That we don't know about. Um, we, they could be, um, there's a lot of possibilities. They, when people encounter UFOs and, and extraterrestrials, they're often described as humanoid. So, and some of them are described as humans. So are there humans living underwater? You know, you have another possibility where you had, what if there was an earlier human civilization that became advanced and then disappeared, right? And they went into hiding or something or moved or had places to live in the oceans and still do. Um, that's possible. There's, there's a lot of possibilities. Um, 
they are, they, and they all seem kind of funny, right? They all seem kind of, seem kind of improbable and silly, but this is, but this is what we're dealing with at this point. Or they could be extraterrestrial and they could have discovered earth some time ago and set up bases in the oceans. And, um, then that's possible too. So, so we really don't know who they are. And in fact, the U S government's language has changed on, we, instead of calling them extraterrestrials or ET, um, we now use the term non-human intelligence or NHI. And that's changed in, in our, in our Congress even has changed their terminology. So we don't know if they're extraterrestrials because they live here, um, probably, but, um, but they might originally have been extraterrestrials. So I'm curious about the physics. So that may be the question that struck you when you saw the, the the history of these cases. Like, what kind of question from physics perspective that was, yeah, maybe strange for you, and that big to you to dig deeper. What what are the questions? Yeah, the the speeds and accelerations are shocking. Um, you can't accelerate at a thousand g's and not expect there to be trouble. Um, most most equipment. I mean, people certainly couldn't survive that. We can't survive more than about you know ten to eleven Gs over short periods of time, and even our aircraft can't survive accelerations like that. Our new our new fighter jets, the F thirty five fighter, the F twenty two, the wings get ripped off at about thirteen and a half Gs. So yeah, they can't even get up to twenty Gs acceleration. Most missiles can maintain some kind of um, directional control up to about 30 Gs, and their airframes can withstand up to about 50 to 60 Gs, but that's it. And then, um, so what happens at a thousand, you know, what happens at a thousand Gs is pretty horrible. You've got, um, imagine that half of you, you're accelerating a thousand Gs, so imagine your top half, let's just use round numbers, is 100 pounds, right? Um, so, so that 100 pounds is going to feel like 100,000 pounds to your lower half. So what's going to happen? What would happen if you put 100,000 pounds on you? You're squished. You're a puddle of goo, right? Um, there's no way you can survive it. So, so what's happening when these objects accelerate is a big question. They it doesn't. They seem to not follow the laws of inertia that we're used to. So it looks like they might be doing something different. Um, so one of the ideas is that they are somehow warping space-time around them so that space and time is flat inside the bubble and then you accelerate the bubble. And that is one possible solution. But but nobody knows for sure what's happening at this point. How possible? Well, we know. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we don't know. We, we don't know how to, how to do something like that. The amounts... The first calculations showed that the amounts of energy needed were really unreasonable, like the mass of the universe and stuff like this. But since then, people have been coming up with other strategies. <clears throat> and worse, you needed what was called negative energy too, which we don't know how to create negative energy or whether it even can exist in any reasonable amount of quantity. But now people are coming up ways of putting bubbles inside of bubbles and and that has gotten the energy um, requirements down to something more reasonable. But um, but it's still not clear. We wouldn't know how to just still how to make something like this or how to do it. But I want to touch again about the the part about the discovering what is in the ocean or and explaining the thing is about the technology we have, the capturing the data, like the radar and the thing is that. When you think about from physics, the technology that we have so far to witness something very advanced, where the trade-off like or limitation that maybe when our system like the technology have failed, where do you think then maybe we need to advance a little bit to see, have accurate data or enable us to a little bit understand what, what is actually in the ocean? And I'm just curious when you think about this bigger question, yeah. Yeah, well, tracking things underwater is really hard because we you can't use any electromagnetic sensing. Electromagnetic fields don't don't propagate far underwater; they get absorbed. So, um, so we're pretty much stuck with sonar. Uh, you have to use sonar where you bounce sound waves off of it. Right? Um, so, if the object's moving very fast away from you, um, faster than the speed of sound, then you aren't going to be able to hit it with sound waves. So you can't measure it that way. Um, there have been a few cases where they've been detected with sonar, and in one case I know 
the object got up to speeds of about 3,000 miles an hour underwater. So it doesn't appear that, it, it appears that you have a situation where, and when, when objects go from air to water, they barely slow down or don't slow down at all, sometimes even speed up. So um, so just like they don't create sonic booms or you have fireballs in the air, it acts like it's not interacting with the air. When they go into water, it almost acts like they're not interacting with the water. But then, then the question comes up as to why would sonar work then? You know, if it's not, if the object is moving through water and not interacting with the water, then sonar shouldn't work. You shouldn't be able to bounce sound waves off of it. So um, what's going on? And I don't think that anybody has an answer at this point. Um, we really don't understand how you can not make sonic booms or fireballs when go going through the air at 40,000 miles an hour or traveling a few thousand miles under over underwater and not creating waves or anything. Um, this would be a big problem. So we don't really understand what's happening. And this, this fact, the fact that we don't understand it leads a lot of people to think that the data has to be wrong. This all has to be nonsense because that's not possible. But, but I don't think that all the data is wrong. I think we have a lot of data at this point, a lot of multiple sources of data with eyewitnesses at the same time. It all corroborates and it just doesn't agree with what we understand. But I think there's a lack in our understanding. Maybe I'm curious about this point when you speculate about this functionality, the feature and intelligence that you, you saw. Do you think it's about the shape of the craft, like the UFO? And is it the material? What is uh, of the energy? When you see about the key factors that from the physics like or design engineering, when you speculate about that, do you think it's a material that, that that the craft use or geometry or the energy they use what it is well i think it could be a little of all of, all of the features because usually when you're engineering you have to have to you know tweak all of those features so it probably is i, I don't think there's a single answer as to what's happening but um and we certainly don't know what that is at this point so it's hard to speculate um the, the amount you can estimate the amounts of energy involved and in, in all cases the amounts of energy are phenomenal. So the maneuvers that the Tic Tacs were making um, in the 2004 Nimitz encounter required about um, 1,000 gigawatts of power, which is more than the nuclear power output of the United States. So this one little craft, you know, 40 feet across long, you know, was producing more power than the entire nuclear power output of the United States. So, again, you have to worry, how, how does that happen, right? And, and when it stops moving, um, that energy had to go somewhere. So where did all that energy go? Um, there should have been an explosion. If it just stops, um, that energy has to go somewhere. But we can't explain that either. So there's a lot we can't explain. And, um, and that's what makes these things really, truly anomalous. So either... So you're left with a situation, either it's really anomalous to the point where we can't explain any aspect of it, or or we are so wrong in our data collection that the errors are would are almost unthinkable as well. So because you have to think how how off would you have to be how off would you have to be to get this to happen and and you would have to be so far off that you would just claim that radar just doesn't work. Maybe the repeatability to make sure that the data is accurate. I'm not sure how do you verify that this is not maybe malfunction in the radar system. I, I, I'm just to, how to ensure that. That's a really important question, worrying about how your data is accurate. So one way to handle that is to use multiple instruments, different types of instruments, right? Measure different aspects. And um, so you can use multiple radar systems at the same time. You can um, you can get infrared imagery and visual imagery from multiple angles with multiple cameras. Um, you try to do things like that, and that's what we try to do at UAPX. And I know the other efforts to collect data are also doing similar things. Other other groups like the Galileo Project or um, IFEX in Germany, um, they're all they're planning on using multiple instruments. So. Um, and that reduces the possibility of error and makes you more confident in your data. So, uh, but now the trick is to find a UFO and to actually 
collect that data, and that's hard to do. Yeah, um, and that's the part I want. Why it's, sometimes it's hard to spot it, and like it's not that frequent, maybe that first question. And of course, from from physics point of view, do you think it could be something, again, it's just a speculation, it's a natural phenomena or just a non-human intelligence state? I know this is something we can't answer, but when you speculate about the frequency this phenomena happen, do you likely just maybe that's non-human intelligence or maybe natural phenomena that we don't know, like a black hole, the thing that we don't know anything about? Yeah, well, I mean, that's... Certainly, you have both possibilities of it being, you know, natural phenomena or non-human craft or even human craft. You have all those possibilities. And it's hard to know what the frequency is. We don't know how many, you know, non-human craft are operating on Earth at any time. So it's hard to estimate what the frequency would be. Um, you can get some idea by looking at the frequency of um, of observed objects that haven't been identified um, so that that helps you better get the frequency. But um, it seems like what you really need to do is find a place where they're observed more frequently than than other places. And um, and these are often sites having to do with the oceans. So off the coast of Catalina Island in Southern California, which is where we went and took our measurements, is one place um, off the northern coast of Puerto Rico. Their UFOs are often seen off the coast of Long Island in New York, off the coast of Wales, and there's places in Australia as well. Um, and so probably setting up equipment in a place where UFOs are more commonly seen and just collecting data uh, over a long term, long period would be would be a smart thing to do. And that's what we're trying to trying to do. Yeah, I'm curious about the UVX so far data. Um, can you tell me like how it's the data looks like or there's spotting anything in the I'm just if you can share it about what is going on at UBX now so so far we've really gone on one mission and that was to Southern California in what was it 2022 I think it was um all my dates are a blur since COVID I can't ever get the year right around COVID for some reason um probably not surprising so that was around yeah so we went to the Southern California there that was all documented in a tear in the sky the the documentary you can see that on Amazon.com and it's probably elsewhere free for free at this point. Um, and we recorded mostly infrared video there. Um, we had some visible video, visible camera videos, and um, with the UFO DAP system, which is a system that has has two cameras in it, one with a fisheye lens that just watches the sky. And then it has some machine learning algorithms that are running. So if there's anything interesting, it focuses another camera to look at it and take pictures or take videos. And so we use that. Um, we also use a thing called the Cosmic Watch, which is a made by MIT. It's a particle detector that you use for radiation detection. So we recorded from that too. So that's basically what our data consisted of. Um, and if you watch the movie, okay, so here's a few spoilers that you won't get in the movie, So perhaps. So in the movie, the, the team, the first thing that was seen is the team, and there was a team on Catalina Island, and then there was a team on the mainland in Laguna Beach. Most of us were on Laguna Beach. And the, the team in Catalina spotted a bright white light that was um, moving very slowly across the sky and uh, very bright, and they identified that it, they couldn't identify it was a plane it wasn't a plane so they contacted us and then at one point this light disappears um and in the movie there's a lot of excitement about this and yes it was great fun um what you get to see in the movie is all of our excitement and doing this for the first time which is probably the best thing to get from the movie um but that turned out to be the space station uh, we had an app on our phone to identify the space station, but the app had an error in it and it didn't take into account daylight savings time. So it was off by an hour. And so we didn't recognize it as the space station right away. Um, it was later, it was um, Professor Matthew Shadagas identified it as the space station. And um, and he, he, he was he's correct about that. We took the videos that we saw. He took the videos we saw. He measured the pixel size. And then he used the distance to the the unknown distance to the space station to figure out how big the space station would be, 
and he got something like 111 feet across and it's about 110 feet. So he was right on, estimated the size of it almost perfectly. So we're confident that's what that was. Um, so the most mysterious thing that we recorded at, um, during that trip was the, was the hole in the clouds with the white, there were several, I count about 50 white dots inside this hole in the clouds that appeared. Um, unfortunately, our our um, infrared cameras had all been unplugged earlier when the film crew left for the night. This was at 4 a.m. when when that happened. Um, they were unplugged around 10 p.m. and the batteries all died by 3 3 a.m. So we didn't actually get infrared video from this of this hole, which would have been really valuable. Actually, um, we got we instead recorded it with the UFO DAP system, which was still running. So we got um, 10 seconds of video or something like this, which was uh, maybe 13 seconds of video, uh, which was not incredibly useful but in figuring out what this was. But there were also, at the same time, were um, some high-energy particles detected with the cosmic watch. So we still think that that was rather anomalous. We don't know what caused what was all going on there. And unfortunately, we we ha were able to get... Um, radar data from nearby weather radar stations and radar data shows that something was going on in that area but it's hard to assess um precisely what that is so so we believe something was happening but um we can't really say what it was unfortunately so it's still a mystery to us even and and we are always kicking ourselves that our infrared cameras weren't running because that would have been perfect Interesting. Maybe I guess about the, the, the globe of light, that's um, that repeated uh, situation, the light and the sphere. There is any light the frequent this rated. Do you think this is has something to do with the, um, what it is, like the, the globe of the light or the sphere? It doesn't have any ringing in your mind or something maybe? I don't know. Oh, like the like orbs that people see, glowing orbs? Yes, yes. Yeah, well, that, that are, they're interesting, and it's not clear what they are. They, they have been studied in Norway. Um, the Hesselton Project had been story, studying these things in Norway, and they've recorded spectra, so they appear to be balls of plasma, kind of like what ball lightning would be, right? But um, but not they're not ball lightning. It's different. And um, plasma mixed in with some kind of min minerals that are present in the soil, so... So it's not clear what's going on. They don't, they're strange because they appear to be balls of plasma, but they, um, in some cases, I know here in Pine Bush, New York, south of where I am, um, similar things have been observed. Um, I don't think they've taken spectra, anybody's gotten spectra of them, but but they appear to act intelligently um, and fly around intelligently. So it's another strange type of thing that doesn't appear to be a craft of any kind, um, but is totally different. So is it a natural phenomenon? Possible. Is it um, some kind of weird living plasma thing? I have no, I'm just making stuff up now at this point, but that's really what you're left with when you can't explain what it is. Um, you're left with just try to come up with some hypotheses and test them. Thomas Thompson Brown. Thomas Thompson Brown. Do you know him? Oh, Thompson Brown. Oh, I don't know much about his work, actually. Somebody recently pointed me to his work. So I don't know much about that. Yeah. Actually, I he was doing, he was doing anti-gravity research with electromagnetism, but I don't know much about it, sadly. But you don't have any comments with it that you, it would be like it doesn't, and also strange theory that, that at this time to, to, to drill about the real advanced physics, do you believe in that the string theory was done at this time to also not advance physics farther. Uh like that string theory was done back then? Is that what you're saying? Or Yeah. No, I don't think that would be true either. I don't think that's true either. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe I want to ask you, do you believe in the abduction stories that uh, the abduction stories about that you already hear the loss? Do you believe this this is true? The abduction stories are difficult. The, of course, the, these things are all hard to believe, right? I mean, I'm, I don't think anybody believes them easily. Um, the difficulty with the, not the difficulty, but the interesting thing about the abduction stories is their consistency. 
their consistency over decades and over you know cultures and countries. I mean, you have people in Nepal, in Congo, in the U.S. all reporting the same things. They report the same things happen to them. They report the same types of beings, and they know there's no reason that you should have that kind of consistency. And um, so John Mack, who was a um, Harvard psychologist who had studied the alien abduction phenomena, he started studying them basically thinking, well, this is a really weird psychological problem these people are having. Why do these people all believe this is happening? And he, and he started studying them. And, and you know, after studying you know, hundreds of cases around the world, um, came to the conclusion that, you know, he put it really well once he said, you know, something like, um, why are, why do people, why do these people all believe they're being abducted? Because it's very simple because they're being abducted. <laughs> and, and I, and, and so I think that, you know, when you look at the consistencies across cultures and time, um, the, it really is compelling. You know, there's, there is some element of truth there, you know, what that truth is, is precisely, I think, is yet unknown. But, but um, I think it's important to study that and to try to understand that, especially because people are claiming. Especially because what people are claiming is rather traumatic. I mean, you've got people who are being traumatized. Um, well, we don't want to help these people and figure out what's actually happening to them. Uh, I, I think that would be instead of laughing at them and making fun of them. I think that's that, which is. I mean, do you really make fun of somebody who's traumatized? I don't think that's very reasonable or nice. And what do you think about the Zimbabwe school? Oh, in Zimbabwe. Yeah, at the Ariel School. Oh, from what I've seen, it looks it looks entirely consistent with what I've seen in other stories and other accounts. Um, the beings are consistent. The craft are consistent. The You've got consistency in the stories of, what, 60 kids, 65 kids? And one teacher who didn't admit to seeing it early on, which is, you know, too bad. Um, but, and I have actually talked to um, Selma Siddick, one of the um, one of the witnesses. She was maybe, what, fourth or fifth grade? Fifth grade, or I think, around the time. And I got to talk to her just a few years ago. And there, that's, there, that's an amazing encounter, actually. And you've got so many witnesses. There was... Um, Impressions in the grass where it landed that were taken, photos taken of that from the UFO researchers who came shortly after. And, um, and, and there's the, the elements of high strangeness, the, the beings that they encounter in these stories, it always gets very weird. Um, something strange going on. And in fact, here it's interesting because even the kids say, they couldn't tell you precisely where the object was sometimes because it would be here and then it would be over there, but then it would be back again. And or um, and the same with the beings. I don't think that they were able to count how many beings there were because they would disappear from a location and appear in another. And one of them, I think, was running in front of the ship and then would, would get to the other side and then reappear here and do it again like he was in a loop. Um, and it And it can't... You can't help but wonder if, I mean, if these if these guys can um, control gravity, um, gravity is closely related to time. So controlling gravity is basically the same as controlling time. So if you have a machine that's messing with gravity, it's probably also messing with time too. And so it's, it's going to look really weird <laughs> to us. And I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, I'm curious about, I'm curious about this one appearing and boiling and disappearing and this is where the difference we are made of molecule and particle which is impossible that we disappear and appear so when you say that if they are have the same structure as human like atoms or it means i'm i'm, I'm, I'm i don't want to, i understand when you mean control gravity what it looks like like if you have imagination let's say i know from say like imagination how it looks like to control gravity what like what is the critical thing to control gravity to do that and, and some of it could be illusion too i mean you don't know you're not some of these craft have really strong electric fields we do know that and electric fields will mess with your brain so are people perceiving things correctly when these objects are around that's not clear either 
So I think it's I think it's very it's again very complicated situations and um and there's sadly no easy answers um were the the the, the real take home message is that these are clearly very strange objects clearly in need of study um it's nothing to be laughed at or made fun of it's something that we should actually be on you know get on the ball and get studying these things when we can I, I would think that's the only thing you can say definitively. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe on to school, what do you think about David Grush and also Bob Lazar? Maybe that's first two. What do you think about them? Uh, all right. um, I'll start with Bob Lazar. I, he, it strikes me that my, my impression is that he probably did have some contact with something, some of the things he describes. I don't believe everything he says because the whole, the whole element fifth one fifteen business is fishy. Um, it would have been easy back then to just pick an element slightly larger than the elements that are known, um, because it would seem possible. But the problem with element one fifteen is there's no stable isotopes, so you can't have a sample of element one fifteen. So then he claimed, you know, somebody called him on that, and then he claims that, well, it was stable when it was in their machine. Well, if it's stable when it's in their machine, then how did you measure it? How did you get it out to measure it to tell that it was 115? You're going to have to put it through a mass spectrometer, which means you're going to have to take it out of their machine, put it through a mass spectrometer, in which case the isotope is going to be, um, they're all unstable. And if it wasn't unstable, then you should know what the isotope is because it won't just be 115, it'll be whatever the actual isotope was. So um, so they should have known what the mass was if they measured it. Um, but that was and but that was never um, he basically walks as a physicist, what it appears, he walks a very narrow line of giving you enough information to make it sound like it could be real but not too much information to be able to prove that it's wrong. And that's, he, he really, I'm talking about Bob Lazar, so he really walks that line. And so, so I find that, I find what he's saying, you know, I don't believe everything that he says, but I don't think it's total nonsense. So it has element of truth to it. I think there's an element of truth, but I don't know what that truth is, so it's difficult. Uh, when it comes to David Grush, when it comes to David Grush, I believe that he saw and learned about um, the programs that he talked about. I think he is telling the truth. Um, it would be silly for him not to, considering that the Inspector General is investigating the cases. So that material that he's discussing, that he discussed to um, Congress, was um, is held by the Inspector General right now, and he's discuss and he's. You know, then they're looking into this. So, for Grush to, you know, make a case to the Inspector General and then lie about it in front of Congress would only get him in trouble. I mean, it's, so there's really, he'd have nothing, he'd have everything to lose just by doing that. Um, so, and, and he could be proven wrong by making any of that public. You know, if he was wrong, but um, so I think he's he's probably telling the truth and. Um, and what he says matches, agrees with what I've heard from other scientists who have worked in these programs. I've talked to other scientists who claim to have worked in these programs, and I believe them, and um, and it matches with what they say as well. So, so I think Rush is probably telling the truth. But I want to see evidence. I mean, I really like to see evidence. That's the most important. The question is, do you think there is a government had already contact with non-human intelligence as you mentioned earlier, do you think there's already contact between them? And so what, what it does it mean even in that case, if it possibly that happened? Yeah. That, that I can't, I couldn't speak to her because I don't really know what the evidence is. So I, I've seen some evidence that can lead me to say that some of these objects are probably non-human tech, but um, that's as far as I can go into speculating, you know, based on evidence, right? Anything else I would say would just be, you know, a guess or a hope or a belief, which I, I'd rather not. I'd rather not do so. I have no idea what our government knows and doesn't know. I have no idea what um, they've been in contact with, or recovered, or studied, even for the most part. 
So before going to maybe uh, this three question, but I want to ask about the funding for your UOBs or your foes here. What will it change in physics if we just assuming that we understand what's happening in UFO or UOB? Like Gary Nolan, when we took him, the, the, the material that like the frog that in, in Roswell's uh, crash site, that it has like frog skin like the metamaterial. I think, I think there's a number of discussions. Clearly already, just looking at the phenomenology, you know, what these objects do and are able to do, there's clearly many areas um, where our science is going to change, where we can learn about some technology. So being able to reach the speeds and accelerations that we observe, I don't know how to begin to do that, but, you know, that, that would certainly be um, transformative. Um, the fact that they, the energies that are involved are clearly in the gigawatt range of energies. Um, the, um, there was a, there's a professor at Stanford I was talking to at the Seoul meeting, and, um, he pointed out that if you have, uh, any engineering system that has any inefficiency, so let's say you have a 1% inefficiency, right? Which means that 1% of your energy is going to go to waste heat, right? You're going to get converted to heat, basically. Um, so, so now take 1% of a gigawatt of power. Um, and if that's your inefficiency, then that means you've got, um, that's a billion watts of power. So that means that 10 megawatts of power is going to be turned to waste heat. How, how do you manage that? That's 10 megawatts of waste heat is just going to melt your spaceship, right? Um, so they either are incredibly good at managing inefficiencies or, um, something else is going on entirely where we, it, to us, it looks like they're dealing with these levels of energy when they're really not. Um, so there's a few possibilities out there, but it's not clear which one it is. And, um, and either way we would learn something big, right? I and mean, there's something important to learn there. Do you, do you think like Lockheed Martin or other aerospace companies have access like such technology, maybe we don't know. That may be, that's a question I want. Maybe a little bit, if you think they have. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I've heard rumors um, about some companies having certain things, but I'm not sure what to believe um, because I've not seen evidence on it. And I am skeptical of, you know, people who make such claims. So it's hard. I would like to see evidence. Um, that would be the best. And that's why at UAP... We need to collect our own data, so we get our own data, and then we actually have evidence, and that that's most most useful. Well, I'd say, so I I don't know. Waiting for somebody else to provide evidence, I think, is pretty futile. I don't think the U.S. government isn't going to tell us what it knows, um, nor is Lockheed Martin or Boeing or McDonnell Douglas or any of those guys. Their their secrets are their secrets, and they're not going to just give them away. Um, I think our best you know, if you want to get information from another country, um, there are other governments that are more open. The South American governments like Chile and Argentina have been more open, these studying these things. And so you might have a better chance of learning about them from those countries. Um, but I think the best bet is for scientists to get involved and to start trying to collect our own data. And scientists will share data and they'll share information. Oh, you have to, to make progress. And so, like, I work, for, I work with UAPX, but I'm also good friends with Wes Waters, who's one of the lead scientists at Galileo Project, and we talk to each other about methods or equipment. And, um, and, and I, of course, know um, Hakan Kayal at IFEX in Germany and uh, Beatrix Villaroyal at the Vasco Project in Sweden, which is a bit different project, but, um, but we're all trying to collect data on UAPs, so we all compare notes and compare share information that way. And I think that's the most productive. Um, and as more scientists get involved, I think that will only grow um, because the more scientists that realize there's something interesting to hear, get to study, they'll, they'll try to study it. The problem really is funding because um, it does take money to do this type of research. So, um, so you can donate to UAPX on our website um, and in the other projects as well. And that that's helpful, but because there are no federal programs to study UFOs right now, so you can't get money from anywhere to study them. So that's a that's a difficult aspect. But 
But I suspect that once you get scientists around the world working together to try to study this, I think 20 years we'll have answers. We'll start getting answers. I don't, I don't think it'll take more than 20 years to start figuring out what's going on. Maybe about the robotics side, I want to touch at the end question about your work robotic and how this could might be helpful to what you do in the instrument, whatever. Can you touch base about what I think it's very interesting and very new yeah, thing in robotics because mostly robotics could from a world community, yeah. Sure, let me, I can show you something. I'll show you what I'm working on. So as I work in robotics is useful, I'm trying to make a camera gimbal system. So this is a, see it. it basically rotates. And this motor here rotates this axis. So you'll set a camera here, and then this thing can then aim and look at whatever you want it to look at. So you can put cameras here. Um, Parabolic microphones, so a parabola with a microphone, so you can record sounds. You can put um, video cameras, whatever equipment here that you want to be directional. And then where these guys are all going to be linked together so that we'll have a machine learning system that will track something. And then all the cameras will turn and track from different locations all at the same time. This, this, this I designed myself and 3D printed, yeah. So this ball is there. And then on the bottom, this is octagonal on the bottom because it, these boxes attach with our equipment in it. So that's very messy right now, but um, right there. But they'll attach all the way around with. And the machine learning will be to uh, like, as you mentioned, in the, the data you collect to like identify the most interesting in the sky or or the, the motion of the system. You look at the most interesting things in the sky, yeah. So some of the things it'll look at, if the machine learning can tell it's an airplane, it won't bother. But if it sees something that's not an airplane or can't identify, then turn all the equipment to look at the same time. So that's where my robotics is coming in. So it's fun, fun, and it's fun to, it's fun to 3D print these things now too. You can design it, you can design it in, you know, a day or so and then print it and then two days later you actually have the thing and so that's really wonderful maybe quick question because most people say it's a drone when you see that that you're full a drone maybe for me your experience why it's not drones quadcopters because some people say maybe the quadcopters or something like that i mean well there are a lot of drones and quadcopters around so you have to be able to identify those if you want to yeah you've got to identify all the things in the sky if you want to find a uh, one of the interesting ones we haven't identified right so, so the final question: What the thing that uh, you wish to maybe in the UFO or UB community to, to achieve? Of course, you include data, but that the thing that you wish to see uh, in your lifetime that, yeah, you were very curious to see a witness, maybe. Yeah, I would, I would like to see an interesting UFO close up. I would really want to see one of these things very close. That would be that would be fun. Um, and if there are beings, I would like to see one. I'd and like what would to be see the one. emotion? Like, um, it, because it's scary. When I think about it. It's oh, frightening. I would, be, I would be, yeah, I'd be excited, excited and scared all at the same time. Yeah, which so would be a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I would probably go running toward it. I would probably go running toward it with excitement and being terrified the whole way. Yeah. So, but that's probably what would happen. And then regret it afterwards. Is is. is because it was radiation or something horrible, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I can't imagine that. Yeah, I don't know if you have any final words for you listening, especially from UFO community. A lot of people like love you, actually. I, a lot of love messages to you. So, um, but yeah, oh, that's right. Have, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. But do you have any words to say, Yell? When uh, like maybe boring with it and cover up. I, I'm not sure if something like very crucial that you want people to think about, and myself included, also. Yeah. Ah, uh, let's see. I don't know. I'm not sure. Something will come to me about an hour from now. That's basically how my brain works. It'll take an hour for it to settle in my mind. And then the thing, oh, why didn't you say this? And the genius mind. Yeah, exactly. It, it's, it's, it's slow. <laughs> it's good, but slow. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, if you, if you're, I mean, if you're interested in Certainly, if you're interested in donating to um, UAPX or any of the other groups, that would be helpful um, because it does cost money. Costs money to make these things, and you know, and we have to make 
we envision making nine of these, you know, with cameras, with different filters and different lenses and everything. And um, so I envision a whole array of cameras all, you know, together watching the sky, you know, for hours and hoping to see something. And that's really, it's, it's a lot like a fishing expedition. It's built on hope, right? Um, you guys have to hope that you see something. And I think that you know, eventually we will. And we're starting to learn where these things are, are observed. Um, I was recently with the Tedesco brothers in um, John, Jerry and John Tedesco, who have their um, RV with their equipment called the Nightcrawler. And they have a book in Amazon.com called Nightcrawler. Um, and so we, me and Wes Waters from the Galileo Project, went down there together um, to see what they were doing. And they used to be with the Galileo Project. So we went to Watch for UFOs for two full, two full nights, all night long, watching for UFOs on Long Island off the coast. Um, and we didn't see anything. It was cold. It was cold because it's, what well, it was March in Long Island, New York, it's, so it's freezing cold. Um, but we got to see some videos that they had already taken of objects that they've seen, which were really interesting. So, I, so I'm so i eager to go back and observe with them you know, for just hopefully to see something because they have seen things. So um, I would like to catch some of that on our instrumentation too. Um, but there's there's now several groups that are out watching, you know, with scientific instruments and, and trying to collect our own data. And eventually we'll succeed. Eventually it'll happen, but it just takes time and effort. Mm. And what's next? Like, uh, maybe that's just, like something we intubate from you, like, I don't know, this year or... Like, besides what you do, really, but like something very exciting? Oh, my God. Now, let's see. What am I up to? I'm going to a con an astronomy conference in in the UK next week, actually. And I'm presenting um, simulations that I've been doing on galactic colonization. So I've been simulating civilizations that colonize other star systems. And... Um, and then I keep track of which ones find Earth. And then you can actually use those stimulations to come up with statistics on what civilizations that find Earth are probably like. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about that at that meeting. And um, and then I'm going to publish a paper on that. So that paper should come out sometime this year. So it'll be a more of a technical paper, but it'll but it'll highlight that galactic colonization is not impossible. Um, which I think is one of the things that scientists need to get over is this idea that interstellar travel is impossible. Um, they thought space travel was impossible, you know, in the early 20s when Robert Goddard was launching his his first rockets. And so it only took 40 years to get to the moon. So um, we got to stop thinking things are impossible. It's a great... Thinking something is impossible is a great way to assure that it doesn't happen, right? <laughs> That's basically it. Um but if you want it to happen, you have to think it is possible. And um, and so the, so that's what this paper basically points out. This this is possible. It is possible for someone to come to Earth. I'm also working on another paper um, called Why Visit Earth, uh, which highlights all the reasons to visit Earth. Um, because that's another strange thing that scientists ask. They'll, they'll say, why would anyone bother to come here? Well, I mean, how many billions of dollars do we spend going to Mars? Earth is a lot more interesting than Mars is, um, but you know, well, there's a lot more life on Mars, and we 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 live on Earth and we study Earth. Um, so, of course, somebody else is going to study Earth and want to come here. But there's there's even better reasons to come to Earth than that, and those will be in my paper too. So that's a bit of a teaser. So that's what I'm working on. So again, I was a delight, and I'm so so grateful that uh, to be here and just listen to you. It was really great. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Kevin. Thank you. Oh well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.